Hello. Um, this video is going to be about the evolution of uh, common law. Common law is a system that you'll find in um, the United Kingdom and indeed um, all, all Anglophone countries to some extent. So um, look at the look at the historic uh, roots of it. Well, <clears throat> it's been uh, it's, it's it's been shaped down the centuries. And um, so Roman law uh, countries have tried to uh, organize their, um, uh, their their legal system into a code, whereas um, common law countries have not, by and large. Now, there are countries which are a melange of the two. For example, South Africa has got common law, but also Romano Dutch law. Um, Pakistan's got Sharia law as well as common law. In some of the northern states of Nigeria, they've got Sharia law. Um, anyway, so. Uh, uh, you know, English law is, is, is something which is solid, it's not uh, abstract, it's based on, on cases. And so um, uh, courts in England and Wales and the other common law countries, they don't consider um, these um, abstruse theories, they consider the case before them and indeed the foregoing cases. So it's um, um, developed um, bit by bit uh, and it's always looked at the, the needs of justice. So whereas the Roman law system, um, it's uh, more theoretically based, perhaps too detached from reality, um, some would say. But uh, the, the merit of the Roman law system is uh, greater cogency. Uh, anyway, so um, let me see. So in France, I talk about there's a hierarchy of uh, legal sources with the French constitution at the apex of uh, this um, system. And case law is not formally considered part of law. Um, anyway, so um, French law is um, a type of Roman law. There's Corpus Juris Civilis, which the um, Byzantine Emperor issued in the 6th century AD. And again, that was a tidying up a smorgasbord of laws, and it was um, terribly confusing. People couldn't figure out what the law actually was, but um, he um, streamlined the system. So France has been through turmoil on many occasions, particularly 1789. Um, before that, they had various parlements, which, despite the word, doesn't mean parliament. It's more like law courts, regional law courts. And there was a great inconsistency there. But uh, anyway, the Civil Code came out in 1804, uh, Le Code Napoleon. So Napoleon Bonaparte, he's the one who gave his imprimatur to it. Now, he was no um, scholar of jurisprudence. He got various legal scholars to do the spade work, and then he signed off on it. Um, there's no retroactivity in that. There's a very first article in the Napoleonic Court Code. Um, um, perhaps uh, accidentally, it, it didn't have any law against homosexuality. Bear in mind that homosexual acts were illegal in almost every country at the time. That may have been an oversight, or was it because his, his brother Louis was gay and he wanted to let him off the hook? Anyway, so um, England has not had um, a revolution since 1688. Even that didn't have enormous legal effect. Okay, it made parliament superior over the crown but it wasn't sort of rewriting or reordering the whole legal framework um so uh anyway so uh barristers solicitors judges they're the ones who've really um shaped uh english law down the centuries um whereas in france it's really been academics um uh, who have um caused it to develop now so let's look at how a common law um grew up well um it was anglo-saxon law then William the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy, he conquered England in 1066, and um, there was no coherent legal system. There were customary laws, there were um, you know, um, a hundred moot, as in a meeting the heads of a hundred families, to deal with law cases on a, on a very local level, and a hundred man who was literate had to be in charge of that. A shire moot, shire means in the word for a county, that's a shire meeting, moot is a meeting, and that's why a moot is a sort of practice case for law students these days. Um, so every quarter, as in every three months, there'd be a shire moot, and they would disc they would sort out legal cases at that level. And then there was the wit and moot, as in the wise meeting of earls and bishops in London every so often. But um, the, the political system and the legal system overlapped to a very great extent. Um, so it was quite arbitrary. Um, the thanes, that's the landlords, they had a great, great role in the administration of justice. But uh, there was no Nemo, Nemo Udex and Causa Sua back then, and um, there were juries, but the, the, the jurors must know the accused, that because then they could judge whether he's telling the truth or not. These days that's not the case. They can know who he is, but they mustn't know him personally. So um, the uh, king, William I, he um, set up the legal system uh, as we know it. He created the, the, the king's court, and he uh, formalised the sort of hierarchy of the courts. 
um, and, and the clergy were very involved in those days. Remember that literacy was very low. So priests and monks were some of the few people who could read and write to a high level. So the king, he traveled around the country, his progress, as they called it, particularly in the summer, staying at the castles of um, the aristocracy. It was an honor to host him and they had to pick up the tab for him and his retinue. So um, uh, anyway, uh, so we'll see how things changed. I mean, eventually in the Middle Ages, they passed a rule that, that um, um, the priests and monks were not allowed to be lawyers. And that's the rule to this day. If you're a lawyer, you can leave the legal profession, be a priest or vice versa. But you can't be both at the same time. Um, OK, so Henry II really um, changed the system after he came to the throne in 1054. Um, so that's what, what led to the murder of Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury. So he wanted to bring order to the country. He wanted to reform land law. And he said that there was um, uh, um, far too much crime. It was rife. And there was this, this parallel system of ecclesiastical courts. And those who claim to be clergy could be judged by those and get much more lenient sentences. Sometimes you're really, really a priest, a monk, and none. But you might have quite a trifling um, claim to be clergy, get claim benefit of clergy because you could read or something. Um, I said that was unfair. There must be a uniform system of justice. Um, so there were only 18 judges to dispense justice throughout the realm. They're often itinerant judges in travelling around. So in 1166, Henry II said that five of them would stay at Westminster permanently to handle cases. Westminster was considered a separate city to London. Westminster, where well, Westminster Abbey is. Westminster is very much part of London these days. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, so there were special um, hotels for these travelling judges to, to stay in when they went from town to town. And there were the assizes, as in the hearings, every so often in a courthouse when the judge would stay there for, for a week or so and then move on to the next one. They'd go on his circuit. We talk about legal circuits and it really was a circuit. The judges were moving around and around, not staying in the same place permanently, except those ones at Westminster. Um, anyway, so the itinerant judges, they were required to apply the laws that been the laws that had evolved at Westminster. And that was the, sort of the idea of having a Supreme Court that we didn't actually call it a Supreme Court back then. Uh, anyway, so the judges' decisions were put down in writing and therefore people couldn't actually know what they were and develop greater consistency. And the doctrine of precedent uh, was uh, established. So um, the common law courts, they were an outgrowth of regal authority and a court is obviously related to the king's court. So we often say a court of justice to make it absolutely clear we're talking about that rather than the king's court. Um, because of the king's court or the royal court where the king actually was, where his government ministers were, various courtiers hung around with him. So um, uh, so th this system wasn't created um, by law in order to uh, administer extant laws. No, they evolved um, in piecemeal to deal with uh, the real issues facing judges. And uh, they were not to solve um, uh, theoretical uh, disputes. So uh, English laws traditionally had uh, some, some, something of a contemulous attitudes towards theoreticians. Um, so anyway, so the, the decision making became predictable, certain principles emerged, um, and then law reports have been made um, ever since. Uh, OK, so supposedly it was to introduce um, uh, placidity and peace um, into uh, England and Wales. Um, up until this time, people have been seeking vengeance on each other. There were blood feuds, but uh, there were dueling. That wasn't to be allowed. It didn't it finally die out until the 19th century, though. So. Um, that we have law so we can resolve these disputes peaceably to regulate conduct between others so people aren't treated unfairly. That's a theory. Um, so uh, the, the law and the courts were to penalise um, felons and those who committed misdemeanours. Um, anyway, so the courts were a service to people. So this is how we could um, settle um, disagreements. Um, the court could provide, provide a judgment on any commercial dispute. Remedies would be offered. Um, now, land was crucial back then. It still matters. Everybody needs land. We need somewhere to live. We all go shopping. We all park a car or whatever. Um, and there's a limited supply of land. I know we can reclaim land from the sea, but that's very, very expensive. Even that would run out eventually. Um, so it would always be in the same place. But remember, in those days, nine out of ten people were farmers. Land was the crucial economic resource. We didn't even dig up that much coal in those days. Um, and so very few other jobs. So it was a struggle to survive, to produce enough food to keep body and soul together was, was most people's daily activity, which is why land and all that was absolutely vital. Um, anyway, so that's why you're to turn to the courts and not to draw the sword in order to 
set this out. Law, um, it maintained the social order. It was a completely uh, inequitable one. Uh, okay, so justice was going to be accessible for everyone, but um, we know that uh, people, most people were severely discriminated against, were serfs, were held in semi-servitude. So equity emerged um, uh, over the centuries because um, uh, the statute law was too rigid and sometimes there was just no law on a certain issue and the court the judge said, well, I can't make a decision. The law doesn't say anything. It doesn't even address this topic. So they wouldn't allow that to happen. So from the 15th century onwards, the common law courts, um, they became um, too um, labyrinthine in their complexity. Byzantin, I, I, I could probably say. And uh, so people said, we've got to have a more efficient uh, system, something which is rapid and not quite so um, uh, pricey. Uh, so judges say, I shall not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. So um, uh, people used to petition the king himself to deal with their grievances, and uh, he listens to their complaints. And sometimes he would even act as a judge himself. There was the chancellor, who was always a clergyman. His son was also the Archbishop of Canterbury. Thomas Becket would be a case in point, a man who's both chancellor and Archbishop of Canterbury. Perhaps I should say Lord Chancellor, really it's Lord Chancellor. He was head of the King's writing department because the King received hundreds of letters a day, all sorts of documents about who paid tax and not, and writs, and, and um, who owned which property, um, judgments handed down from court, someone's found guilty, if so, what punishment, someone's found not guilty, and so forth. So the um, Chancellor, he couldn't deal with all these documents himself. He had a, a group of, of scribes, clerks, to deal with that, filing it all away. So this was also legal records. So the Chancellery is his writing department. And as the Court of Chancery emerged, remember the King, we were all Catholics um, in the British Isles back then, the King would confess to the Lord Chancellor, he was keeper of the King's conscience, and he tried to persuade the King to be more merciful if he wanted our Lord to be, to be uh, merciful with him. Um, so the Court of Chancery tries to do things what they consider to be ethical rather than what is strictly adhering to the statute. So um, the Lord Chancellor could grant personal relief or, or, or deny it, um, despite the precedent, um, according to what he felt um, was ethical. So in 1474, the Lord Chancellor issued a decree um, uh, by his own name for the very first time, and the Court of Chancery seemed to diverge from the King's Courts from that time. Equity clearly emerged. So equity um, creates trusts. This had to be created in the Middle, Middle Ages when uh, someone was going off to the Crusades to fight in, in the Levant and say to someone, OK, you, you, you own my land, you hold my land, give it to me when I come back. So the Crusader goes off, comes back after a few years, can I have my land back? No. But you have to give it back. So what? But it belongs to me. Well, I don't care. You give it to me. So the guy who was given it um, uh, was meant to return it and, and couldn't be forced to do so because legally he owned it. So this is when a con concept of trust was used to deal with this situation. Um, okay, so they recognise trusts, which is holding land on behalf of another. It's the beneficiary is the person who's meant to actually benefit from it. So the beneficiaries have rights that, which are enforceable against trustees because common law um, uh, didn't recognise this and said the trustees own it. That is that. So equity set up new remedies. So if the Chancellor believed someone had been wronged, the court would um, establish a remedy. So, um, and these were remedies which could not be found in the common law courts. So the common law courts was usually issued damages, that was it. Equity uh, was more creative. Um, it invented other things such as specific performances and you must actually do this. Um, or indeed um, injunctions saying you must not uh, carry out a certain course of action, so forth. It was much better dealing with contract. So the Court of Chancery um, uh, was very pricey. Um, the um, uh, cases uh, took a very long time indeed. Um, so the 19th century, um, the Court of Chancery was um, lampooned and lambasted by Charles Dickens, who was the most uh, famous writer in any language uh, at that time. And in Bleak House, he really um, sent up the Court of Chancery because he, he'd lived in um, the city of London, as in right beside the law courts. And this is what he had to say in ridiculing the Court of Chancery. This is the Court of Chancery, which has its decaying houses and blighted lands in every shire, which has its worn out lunatic in every madhouse and its dead in every churchyard, which has its ruined suitor with his slipshod heels and threadbare dress borrowing and begging through the round of every man's acquaintance, which gives m to moneyed might the means abundantly of wearing out the right, which so exhausts finance, patience, courage, hope, so overthrows the brain and breaks the heart, that there is no honourable man amongst his practitioners who would not give you, 
who does not give you this warning suffer any wrong that can be done rather than come here. Close quotation. So that's from the opening of, of um, Bleak House. And there's um, he also um, ridiculed it in, the, in this fictitious case called um, uh, John Dice versus John Dice, which goes on for, for generations and bankrupts them both, but makes a fat fortune for these uh, avaricious attorneys. So um, in 1873, the two systems were fused by the Judicature Acts, which, which went on being passed till 1875. So equity and law uh, had been two um, separate parallel systems. Um, uh, the Earl of Oxford case in 1615, it was decided that if the two collided, then equity would take precedence. Um, anyway, so in the High Court, there's still a chancery division, uh, but that deals with uh, common law and equitable principles as well as remedies. The chancery division of the High Court um, is about um, company law, about conveyancing as in title deeds, property wills, probate. When probate, somebody dies, you've got to find out what, what um, they actually own. Probate is like proven. You've proved that they do own these assets. Because sometimes we don't know how much money they have in the bank. Which land do they actually own? Do they own this car or not? What debts do they have to settle? And only when we sort all that out, we have probate. We know this estate is worth £100,000 or whatever it is. Okay, so, um, and then we still still chancery lane right beside the inns of court. Um, from that. So some chancery barristers who make a mint said to be terribly intellectual branch of the law. All right, that's enough for the moment. Toodaloo.